Okay, we're back. We're live. It's uh, 1 p.m. on a given Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and it's about community matters, which matters. Community matters. Okay, we have Victor Gemignani. Um, he has been with um, the Appleseed Foundation, and he is now with Lawyers for Equal Justice. 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 Okay, Thanks, it's very important. You know, I always. I, I always say that uh, you know law school teaches us about the rule of law, but very often it does not motivate us to actually make the rule of law happen and uh, participate in the in the political um, process and make our community better. Too many too many people get out of law school; they're not oriented that way. But I want to assure you that Victor is. Victor is oriented that way. He participates in community. He cares deeply about the state and, and, and the federal government. And we're here to talk about the prisons, but anything and everything that associates with the prisons. We have a problem with the correction system and justice system in our state. And I would like him to talk about it in the time of the Corona crisis. Welcome to the show, Victor. Happy to be here. Just make a slight correction. I'm retired at this point. I created LEJ first, Lawyers for Equal Justice, to be a litigation arm for the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii. Uh, and that merged uh, after many years into the Hawaii uh, just, uh, uh, Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice, which I most recently resigned from, or retired okay. from after 15 years. Right. Great. But that, you know, that qualifies you to discuss so many things in our community and in our, in our social policy. Um, so I, I would like to ask you, you know, uh, we've had we've had a number of issues around around the prison, although, you know, people don't think about the prison much, you know, isn't that true? They walk down on Main Street, so to speak, you know, why people don't know about it. They don't care about it unless they have a relative inside. Um, you know, that's them. And this is us. Uh, and they don't address the issues that come out of it. But there are plenty of issues. I mean, you know, one is is, is and the most primary re really these days is is it safe? This is like out of the marathon, man. Is it safe to be in O Triple C right now, or are you are you um, exposed to a higher risk than than everywhere else of, of getting the uh, the virus? Well, I think you you clearly are. Uh, I mean, the uh, uh, examples we've had on the cruise ships uh, with contained uh, um, uh, people being potentially exposed to the uh, virus as an indication. What's happened recently in our our navy. Um, with one of the major aircraft carriers being withdrawn, because I think something like a thousand out of four thousand people were uh, sailors were infected. You're going to see this uh, as an uptick in our Hawaii jails, and it's happened, uh, by the way, around the country. Uh, we have are fortunate to be in Hawaii in that there hasn't been um, the rate of infection that you found in other uh, major places in the United States. But in those where outbreaks have occurred, particularly where there are uh, federal and state prisons and populations, the, the figures of infected individuals have spiked. You're just too close to them. You don't have the opportunity to have uh, sanitary conditions. Uh, your eating facilities are different. Uh, you're treated differently. Um, so bottom line is you share uh, a, a very small quarters with normally more than one person. Um, so the bottom line is the potential for infection is, is significant in, uh, in uh, Hawaii jails as well as any other jail in the United States. Yeah, so, you know, lawyers for equal justice um, it also includes law lawyers for equal medicine. I mean, for equal medicine. Um, are they getting equal medicine, uh, the people who are incarcerated in OCCC and other, other prisons in Hawaii? Of course not. And they're not getting equal justice either. We all know that. Yeah. Uh, when you're caught in that system, you're in big, big kinchi. Uh, and the bottom line is if you have a medical condition, you'll stand in line until you can get some form of, of uh, uh, person to take a look at you and, and give you some initial uh, advice as to what you may want to do. But in terms of serious uh, oversight and, and treatment. I, I don't think anyone's going to make an argument. You've got equal access to medical treatment than, uh, than uh, others that are out in society that can walk around and access it to the nonprofit hospitals or their emergency wards. What does stand in line mean? Does that mean wait a long time? Yeah, it could be. It's not like, not like Juliana in terms of what's happening in the medical system or in our jails, but yeah, definitely stand in line. Priorities in all kinds of situations uh, are set. And clearly when a prisoner uh, wants to get medical attention for something that they may think they have, um, they're going to have to wait for their priority to come up and their number to come up. And it may be high, it may be low. It depends on who's on staff at the time to evaluate the request. And some, it, it depends on the, the opportunities or capabilities the individual prison has to provide medical care, much less contracts with outside providers that at this point may 
be somewhat skeptical about taking uh, inmates in, given the potential for infection. Yeah, yeah sure. And then there's the old problem, which, uh, which I've, I've seen this problem addressed earlier, and that is the problem of families visiting their relatives who happen to be incarcerated. If they haven't been tested, you don't know, but you know that they're at a higher risk. So does the family go to see them? Uh, and then could the family carry that right outside? Yeah, they, the family may not even be able to see them in some situations, depending upon whether there's any outbreaks that occur in our prisons, who's kidding who. Uh, the authorities will shut off contact. The uh, most tragic thing that I've seen, to be frank with you, of what's been happening throughout the entire United States, in particular the visuals you get from New York City, are loved ones uh, saying goodbye to their grandparents and their mothers and their fathers and their sisters at the door of the emergency ward and never seeing them again, and those people dying by themselves. Uh, without having the touch of their families available uh, and the ability to start the healing process as quickly as possible. Um, that, that's going to be double or triple for uh, inmates, uh, particularly if in fact uh, uh, people don't even have a chance to say goodbye because the people all of a sudden are locked in continually because of an outbreak, a spike in the, in the jail. Visitors are not allowed. A visitor a, a inmates get sick and hopefully doesn't die, but consequences are significant in terms of communication and comfort in, in these times much greater than I think than the average citizen. And for understandable reasons, I'm not suggesting that these are not barriers and problems that have to be overcome, they, they are. Mm. Well, I mean, it, it, it offers a, another question and that is, uh, what do you say to people in the community who are perfectly law-abiding, who don't really care about OCCC or the justice system, they're not involved, um, it's, not, it's not their bailiwick at all, um, and uh, they don't care. They don't care. If these people are convicted of a crime, why should we care about them and their health? They're, they are where they have to be. Just keep them away from me. Um, I'm not particularly concerned. I have my own issues, my own risks, my own health to worry about. I'm out of money. I don't have a job. That's the last thing on my agenda. What do you say to them? I say to them, the majority of people we're talking about are pre-trial. They are there, held there for normally minor offenses, sleeping in the park at night, the sweeps that be, the uh, uh, sweeps that have been going on continuing during the entire uh, virus, uh, virus that we've had, uh, walking on the beach, whatever the misdemeanor might be. They're in there and it hasn't even been tried yet. They're pre-trial. They just don't have the bail necessary to get them out. So for a variety of reasons, and, our, and our, as a general understanding, our, our jails are way overcrowded. There's a differentiation between jails and prisons. Jails are, uh, are institutions that keep people prior to conviction. Then after the, uh, the conviction is, is uh, either uh, upheld or denied, uh, whatever's going to happen in that person's life takes place, sometimes often transferred to a jail, but not always. Uh, so no, I would say to the person two things. Number one, the great majority of people we're talking about that are incarcerated in the, in the institutions we're talking about right now are prejudgment. They have not had a trial. They're presumed to be innocent. Number two, overwhelmingly number of people that we're talking about in this category ought to be, are in there for minor offenses, nothing significant in their lives, nothing, in, nothing that has victims attached and there's potential for uh, community to suffer again because of the, the, uh, the, uh, the act being committed again. These are mostly nonviolent people that have just stuck in jail because they don't have bail and they're in an unfortunate situation of being found to be uh, uh, arrested for something. Sometimes yeah. guilty, sometimes not, but again, prejudgment. Yeah. And, you know, and, be, that, that should mean something, presumed to be innocent. Well, I think we all have to care about our fellow human being. Mm -hmm. There but for the grace of God go all of us. Some of them are there completely erroneously, and uh, we have to care about all of them. Exactly. Um, and, you know, and that's the lesson, I suppose. People keep saying that. We're in this together. We have to care about our fellow human being. And this is an example of where it really counts. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about um, let's talk about what can be done. You know, I I wanted to mention to you that uh, I saw an article not too long ago about the fact that O Triple C was overcrowded clearly and for years. But there's a prison um, northwest of north, southwest of Hilo, uh, out in the boonies there near the volcano, I guess, um, that is undercrowded. Uh, the population there is smaller than designed for. Um, why don't we equalize this so that um, you don't have overcrowded in one place and undercrowded in another? Wouldn't that be better for everyone? 
Yeah, there are other solutions like decriminalize a number of uh, uh, laws that we have that are throwing people in for really not doing much for purpose, except costing us a lot of money and putting them in terrible situations. There may be, uh, I'm, again, this is not my kuleana, but there may be transportation issues. When you have someone that has trials and appearances that are necessary to be done in Honolulu, you have to transport them back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to Hilo. So it really would determine, be determined by who's going to be maintained there, either long-term or short-term, is it pre-trial or, or, or post-trial uh, and post-conviction? Uh, are they uh, 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 going to have certain needs that they're going to have that are going to require return to Honolulu or some other jurisdiction? Uh, are, is the jail safe in Hilo uh, to, uh, to populate the people you, miss, you wish to populate? How big is the, is, the, is the place in Hilo or the amount of land available? And by the way, I guarantee uh, if you talk about expanding jail population or jail capacity in Hilo, I imagine the people in Hilo are going to probably say, I really don't think that's something we want to do in our community, but I'd leave it up to the people of Hilo. <laughs> and I spent many years in that community, and I think they probably come out with the right answer. But bottom line is, there's lots of problems potentially with that. But that's not my cool I just don't know enough about it. Okay. Well, you know, right now, if we wanted to do something um, to deal with this issue, we really couldn't. I mean, the legislature um, is not in session, and it's not likely this is going to, you know, be um, at the top of the heap if it were in session. But what issues have been pending for reform in Hawaii? And how successful have they been? In terms of prisons? Yeah. Or economic prisons? Prisons. Again, not my kuleana, uh, but the ones I'm aware of, there have been continuous attempts, uh, futile attempts at the legislature. It's not unusual. The legislature is, is, is poster child for delay uh, uh, and uh, uh, kicking the decisions down the road. Uh, but there have been some uh, issues around uh, decriminalization and redefinition of what kind of penalties are really appropriate. More uh, money and more programs put into uh, renovating someone, rejuvenating their abilities to produce something meaningful in their life and, and deal with some of the ghosts that they have from uh, the abuse that they may have suffered or the mental illness that they're currently suffering from. So a big emphasis on expansion of uh, uh, hospital or mental, mental health capacity for prisoners, big expansion on preparing them uh, to rejoin society in a serious way in terms of with some skill that's marketable, uh, and some uh, attempts to uh, avoid uh, the incarceration to begin with by declassifying certain laws that are really not things that we ought to necessarily criminalize, or at least not the degree we are today with the penalties of uh, incarceration uh, being a uh, potential result. You know, I don't know why, but this, this uh, raises the comparison of um, American justice, the American justice and correctional system with Europe. I remember on, uh, I guess it was uh, 60 Minutes, uh, a couple of years ago, they had a very interesting examination of, uh, of prisons in Germany. Uh, and they demonstrated uh, in many cases that there were individuals who had committed what we would consider very serious crimes like murder. Uh, and they were out in the community. That part of their prison sentence was served out in the community, and, and they were treated as rehabilitated, um, you know, early on. Um, and they were given every chance to reintegrate into the community. You know, the, the title of our show, Rehabilitation Com Coming Soon. Um, and they really believe in that, and that's their system, and it works, um, at least according to that documentary. Why, why can't we do that in this country? Why are we... Why are we living in the 19th century, Victor? What can we do about coming into the 21st? Well, you're old enough and I'm old enough to remember the Dukakis campaign in 1988, when, uh, Bush the first, uh, the father, uh, uh, killed him in a campaign uh, when, with the Willie Horton uh, commercial. And basically, Willie Horton, Horton, as you remember, is a, a man that had been uh, let out of jail on parole uh, and had been approved by the governor uh, and a variety of other individuals. And the guy went back and, and killed, uh, I think, a, a, a woman, uh, a white woman, unfortunately, and it became even more racist in terms of the campaign. That did, uh, I, when we saw that, I thought Dukakis' campaign was over, which it was, him that, him riding around in a, a helmet in, a, in, a, in an M1 uh, the tank, uh, totally out of character. Uh, the bottom line is, I think, uh, politicians too often have used uh, the, the uh, threat of uh, criminal violence being uh, uh, 
put upon you uh, to terrify the population to some extent and not prevent provided the kind of fertile um, programs that have track records uh, and are um, uh, measurable in terms of what they produce and go and go and say we ought to do you said it a while how can you justify how can i guide the guy in the street when he's seeing everything's okay but these guys committed a, a, a violation of law and they're locked away i don't care about it how do you reverse that kind of trend you reverse it i think by uh, making people understand that number one some of these people are, are definitely rehabbable uh and we ought to start programs that are proven to be able to do that and uh, number two uh put a face on the people uh, that are languishing and the lack of development they're going to have in terms of the ability of taxpayers to get out from under the burden of paying for these individuals that are incarcerated. And you well know the cost of incarceration in this country is, is unbelievable. You could spend a kid, send a kid to Harvard uh, on a yearly basis for the kid, amount of money we put in, in, into uh, taking care of one person in a federal penitentiary. So bottom line is there's economics and the Republicans, I think, about 15 years ago, and, and the National Republican Party grabbed onto this as, a, as a, uh, an ability to save dollars, and progressives grabbed onto it because of ruined lives, and we came together, and there was, in fact, a significant uh, change uh, uh, to uh, the opportunity for people to get probation and get out and start their lives again. About uh, six months ago, eight months ago, it was very much uh, PR'd by the president as one of his major civil rights uh, issues or agenda agenda issues that he is associated with. Uh, more like that are necessary, more leadership at the, at, the, at the local and national level, and more opportunity, be, by, the, by the way, for communities and more responsibility for communities to allow uh, the development of institutions that are going to maintain in a proper way, in a community integrated way, populations to be in their, in their community, because these people have to be put to somewhere. And the more you keep them in a dungeon state, the more they're going to come out with a dungeon mentality. I should tell you, when I started my litigation in the 1960s in the South, in Atlanta and Georgia, uh, I did primarily prison litigation uh, when I came out of the shoot as a young kid out of law school. So I got to know a little bit about the systems that were uh, in play back in Georgia in 1969, 1970, 1971 in the small little jails and a little bit in the larger jails uh, around Atlanta. Uh, and the, the, in, the mentality that basically people had was throw them in there, lock up the key. And this is pre-trial pre, uh, pre, uh, 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 as well as a, a, a sub-trial. Uh, how do you reverse that mentality except modeling better behavior, finding commonalities of why people should support things that they normally wouldn't support together, i.e. the fiscal uh, difficulties that we're going to encounter in this state uh, as well as elsewhere in the country, and the opportunity to have redemption, which is a core value, I think, of Hawaii and, and our people here, as long as it's not done by uh, con people, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I found religion after being uh, caught drunk in some alley, uh, a politician, you know. Oh, I found religion. I'm going to have now a second run mayor, or governor, or whatever it might be. You have to be realistic about who's ultimately going to be redeemed. But as a Christian, as a Catholic, as a fallen Catholic, but someone who was trained by the Jesuits for 20 years, I very much appreciate the opportunity for individuals to make corrections in their lives and get about the business of being productive. So, we ought to have all of that in our brain as we try to how to figure reconfigure our institutions, especially now, given the lack of the dollars that we're going to have to funnel dollars into the state priorities. I mean, yeah, yeah. The is that your your income streams are disastrous in the state right now. Uh, you know, your GET has been decimated. You have no tourists. They pay a third of it normally. You don't have no tourists coming over here. It's being borne by the backs of the, of the, the poorest of the poor, for the most part. Much higher tax rates with GET for the lower, lower income as opposed to the higher income. Uh, and uh, the jobs have disappeared. So you have income that is, is not there at all until maybe you're going to get unemployment. I have friends all over here that are still waiting for the first unemployment check they put it in two months ago, and they're not people that can survive without a paycheck. So we have lots of issues to deal with in this community, and a lot of them have dollars and cents as associated, and a lot of them have funding streams. What do we want to do about tourism? Where is tourism going to be the, the gorilla on the hill the way it has been? I can tell you, living in Kailua, to walk on Kailua Beach and see the beauty and the pristine nature of that beach, I don't think anybody here wants to go back to where we were three months ago, packed and packed with tourists, you know, as far as the eye can see. So yeah. the leaders of our state are going to have to put all of this together. And I would suspect if they're enlightened and want to save money, prison reform may be something, one of those opportunities that rises from these crises, which I think are the most valuable thing we can ever do. When you have a crisis, use it for something that's good. 
and every crisis provides opportunities for redefinement of what you're doing and re your resetting of a business plan that may or may not work in the future, new technology to deliver a product you're trying to deliver, whatever. So aim, aim into that. You know, uh, one thing, you know, certainly it costs a lot of money to incarcerate a lot of people. And this country has tens of millions of people in jail and it costs everybody a lot of money. Um, and it costs Hawaii a lot of money. Uh, ergo, um, you know, the, the, the thing about uh, we, we don't have the prisons here. So we send them to where is it? Arizona. Uh -huh. Arizona. It's cheaper and more brutal. That's what I get out of it. And more distant from everyone they need in their health, in their lives, to get back on track of why they want, don't want to be in jail. And it's right. ridiculous. It's totally self-defeating in terms of uh, rehabbing the prisoners. We ultimately could separate them from families. How, how could anybody defend that? I mean, any government of Dollars and cents. Dollars and cents. What you said before, Jay, who cares about prisoners? I think we ought to care. But who cares? And too many people don't. And number two, our leadership, which is a disaster in this issue of, uh, of, our, of our state legislature and governors and has been for a long, long time. It's just no sympathy, no leadership to go forward and say and paint a different picture of what life could be, how life is different in another place that we admire and we respect. We were talking about Sweden. Um, I mean, they didn't even close doors. Uh, they didn't even they shelter at home, uh, that country. We'll yes. see the results of it. But there's different ways you can visualize how society operates and clearly we have enough problems in our community we ought to be looking always elsewhere to find out whether there's something relevant that can be brought home and changed around culturally to, to fit uh, nicely into how we want our lives to be in the future yeah and, and you know one thing you you mentioned of course that we have a challenge and an opportunity going forward but let me add this thought you know, there's been a lot of talk about scammers who take advantage. Um, they use COVID as an opportunity to rip off other people. And my own, my own uh, belief, expectation is that the hungrier people are, the more street crime we're going to have, the more burglary we're going to have, the more, you know, I don't know what to call it, petty crime, but the crime, crime that, that emanates from hunger. Uh, we're going to have a lot of that, and some of them will go to prison. Uh, they'll go through the justice system, although right now, and I want to ask you about this, right now the justice system is a little gummed up. Um, we, can't, we can't have trials, so we can't prosecute so well. Um, and it, it really must be a kind of a, a tumult in the justice system. Um, so, you know, we have, we have our challenges during and we have our challenges afterward of having a lot of people who are driven to criminal activity because they have no food, uh, which is a serious problem. Um, but, you know, what do you think about that? This is a sort of a, a very uneven road, a road filled with potholes before we even get to the point where we think about long-term reform. I agree. Uh, I mean, the more pe desperate people become, um, you know, they have themselves to support, but more importantly, they have their, their families and their children to support. So attractions that uh, they may not uh, ever consider when they're employed and everything is functioning in their lives are going to start to be considered that's a fact of life and crime will obviously have to uh, have an uptick i would suspect unless people find a way to survive uh, during the next six to 12 months in a way that allow them to readjust their their spending patterns and readjust their uh, employment uh, uh, possibilities so yeah it's going to happen that's even more of a reason in my opinion to to uh, start to put as much uh, effort and uh, and quality work uh, in rehabbing a, a community because we're going to continue to have that kind of drain if they're not. Um, you either keep people incarcerated under bad conditions for a very long period of time, and then you have whatever comes out of the system. That's basically what you've created. Amen uh, to that. I, I think that's that, a piece of human nature. You know, um, uh, if you if you look at the history of uh, terrorism in the Middle East. You find that every single terrorist, including Osama bin Laden and all his friends, they all got proselytized in jail. Every bloody one of them. And, and in jail means even in relatively civilized countries like Egypt, I don't know how civilized you would say it is, but um, they were in jail, they were brutalized in jail, they were tortured in jail. Uh, it was all terribly unfair. Some of them started out as students who attended a protest. Before you know it, they're in jail for a long time. Uh, terrible, unfair things happen. When they get out, they become dyed in the wool, you know, lifelong terrorists bent on destruction. And so you can see that jail can be a very negative feature, even for a person who is, you know, young and impressionable and doesn't have to go that way. Why do these, why do these terrorists 
came from you know well-to-do families, but they got proselytized anyway. They got, you know, what's the word? They they got switched around, um, and that must happen here to to maybe the same you know the same way, but maybe to a lesser extent. Um, but we have to be very careful about being humane in jail. The worst thing to me is when you get a kid for whatever reason, 18, 20, 22 years old, maybe foster care system uh, uh, alumni, uh, probably abuse in their family of some form as they were growing up, either mental or emotional or, or physical or sexual, God forbid. Uh, and they go into a system like the jail for shoplifting or stealing a car. They have two options. They can either listen to the people, the other prisoners in the jail, they're going to bring them in like part of their ohana, and they're going to learn a trade, an occupation about how not just to do shoplifting, but how to hotwire a car, how to fence a car, the parts in a car, uh, how to break in houses, uh, how to hold people up. They're going to learn the techniques that people in jail that are diehards die are going to understand. And therefore, our kids are basically being put into the system where they have very few options available to them unless they have an incredible strong ability to resist the temptations and the physical violence that they're going to be suffering and decide to go the straight and narrow and work for parole at some point that makes sense and do whatever they can to access programs that are going to educate them. So two options. So in my sense, especially when your kids are young, get them out of that system as early as you can and get them into a, a track that's going to help them. Both. And that's a lot of mental health, by the way. It's stuff that our state does not want to do. And stuff our state decimated uh, in the leadership in 208, 209, the last great recession. We decimated our mental health system. And it's one of the reasons you have the, the, the problems you have in our in Hawaii in the streets right now. So the bottom line is, again, get the kids out of the system as early as, they, as you can and get them into appropriate uh, processes that are measured, uh, that are nonprofit for all intents and purposes, uh, and quality based and have abilities to be able to show that they got the track record to produce something better than what they had, what they started with the child coming mm -hmm. into the system. So who's on the line here? Who is speaking to this issue uh, in the courts, in public, um, you know, among the institutions that could yeah. do some change? Yeah, there's only a couple, unfortunately. Uh, and Hawaii Appleseed has not been in the forefront of this. Uh, and they've not been, in the, and Lawyers for Equal Justice has not been in the forefront. The ACLU, right now, though, there's good litigation going on uh, with the uh, Public Safety Department to try to get as many people released from prison that are appropriate as possible. The HUI that's doing that work for all intents and purposes is the ACLU, Lawyers for Equal Justice, and the Public Defenders. They've gone to the Supreme Court, they've got a petition to the Supreme Court, they've got a special master appointed. Uh, Dan Foley, uh, he came back with a recommendation. That recommendation uh, was reviewed by the Supreme Court. Uh, the three advocate programs that I suggested went back in and said we ought to have something more extensive that is uh, appropriate. And the Supreme Court came down with a really good order that's going to prioritize certain people that at least when you take a look at them, their files seem to indicate they're a candidate for release. And then it goes back to a judge to make a final choice as to whether that candidate can should be released. But the, uh, the public defenders arguing on one side and, and the uh, 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 attorney general on the other side, the prosecutors on the other side. Um, so bottom line is there'll be a, a process and it'll be a fairly quick process to start to take a look at the population and start to decrease it as significantly as possible within the shortest time possible within the context of safety, 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 public safety, safety, safety. So that's a hui that's been doing that work. Outside of that hui, which was an, a, 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 group, a group that came together, it had relationships in the past, but not really did work together very, very, clear, very, very closely. Uh, not because of priorities, but because of work that we did, and not that similar in some some situations. Uh, from before that, there was only the ACLU that spent a lot of time on prison work. Uh, not particularly successful, as best I can understand. But again, I have not been involved directly in that work. It's the legislature that has not been particularly cooperative. And there's an organization run by a woman who's the godsend, I mean, the, the angel from heaven uh, in the community, Kat Brady, uh, who's been around for quite some time. And she runs an association, I wish I knew their name, of uh, prisoner reform advocates and works closely with the ACLU and others to ultimately get more uh, discussion uh, and hopefully um, results in prison reform. Again, I don't think they've been particularly sex successful with this leadership, but you know, mm. this leadership has never been particularly supportive of most of these ideas, in my opinion, anyway. You know, a lot of people, including me, uh, grew up to think that the federal government was uh, concerned, the Attorney General of the United States was concerned about uh, human rights and civil rights. They were the codification of uh, our morality, so to speak. But now we have, uh, we have an administration that you, you couldn't say that about this administration. 
um, and Donald Trump, uh, may his name be erased, um, you know, I don't think he's been doing anything about this. And I don't think William Barr, may his name be erased, is doing anything good about it. Uh, what's missing there? Um, do you think that they're going to ride in one day, the, the federal government going to ride in and be concerned about civil rights and human rights and, and do large scale nationwide prison reform to alleviate some of these problems? Uh, again, the hope would be that Republicans and the Democrats in the national office and the president, which happened this last four or five months ago, could come to agreement on certain things that they think are necessary to depopulate the systems in a humane way. I think that's possible because of the progressive nature of most Democrats and the fiscal, the traditionally fiscal uh, uh, concerned uh, 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 leadership of the, of the Republican Party. That sort of disappeared big time under the Trump administration for all intents and purposes. They used to be fiscally conservative, which meant they want to save dollars when not appropriate. So that, that hooey, that partnership could get together, that political partnership could get together. Uh, I personally have, I grew up again, in civil rights in the South. Uh, that's where I did most of my early work. Um, so I have a great respect for the Department of Justice and they were unbelievable allies in Georgia and South Carolina and Florida and Tennessee uh, all through the 60s and 70s. And to be frank with you, into the 80s, although it got a little, little, little bit soft under Reagan. Uh, and they were great under, under Clinton and they were great under, under Obama. George, both George Bushes, I don't think, did harm to the Justice Department. They may not have put them on priorities they thought were necessary from their perspective, but they didn't do any harm in the way we've had in the last uh, three years. Uh, I worry very much that the depopulation of our institutions, Justice Department, uh, uh, the uh, Department of Human Services, Department of Housing, the National Department of Education, uh, that they have been so um, depersonalized of, uh, of people that supported those kinds of agendas that it's going to be hard to repopulate them again. So they're going to have a hard time struggling, not only to find the leadership that's going to be able to get them back to where they, we think they have to be, institutions we respect and honor that are above politics and honor the issue that they're, they're responsible for. Uh, we're going to be in bad shape for a long time. We've got to populate those with leaders and you've got to populate those with lower staff members that can get up to speed quickly because they've basically taken institutional memory and institutional mechanizations and they've thrown them out. Uh, because he uh, doesn't like authority and uh, to be frank with you, he issues economy and the more you can get government out of any form of oversight of economy, hey, everybody's free, do what you want to do, money will just roll in for all of the people that have, uh, have that as, an, as a priority in their life. But where our economy is being screwed, our kids are not getting educated, our air is being befouled, our water is being befouled, um, tax policy is being uh, driven more and more to the wealthy, it's all bad. So the question is, are those institutions ever going to be able to find their way? I believe, I believe very much in this country. I think it's an incredible place. We've gone through a bad spell. And as someone that, by the way, I've traveled internationally continually. I've driven 65, 70 state, uh, countries in my life. The respect we used to have was unbelievable. And the nose dive it's taken in the last four years is just, it's heartbreaking. We can get better. And we will. And it's a quote I put in a paper recently uh, from... Uh, um, uh, um, Lexus to Tocqueville. In a democracy, people get the government they deserve. And I personally think we didn't deserve the government we got, but maybe we did because we relaxed in certain places and certain agendas and certain messages got through to certain people to allow them to be convinced we needed a new start. Maybe we didn't listen to people, you know, except in the coasts and maybe in the islands, uh, you know, and those are the people that ultimately felt disenfranchised and elected this terrible man. Um, bottom line is, we were a democracy and we got what we deserved. I, I can't imagine knowing what we know now uh, in, in another uh, six months uh, that we're not going to have a different result. Um, yeah. Everyone has seen this, this court, this vote virus has always been driven home what we were always afraid would happen. We'd have a crisis during his time, nuclear war with Korea, uh, war with uh, China, either economic or, or whatever, uh, or real. Uh, we never thought pandemic, uh, but bottom line is he's been a poster child for God. I hope he can just get through four years. And it's, it's clear we have not been able to. And this, when we open up, which we're dying to do right now in a lot of places, it's going to be a spike and it's going to go right back to where we were. And everybody says, oh, forget about it. We'll have a virus. Yeah. You're not going to pick up the pieces of this economy uh, and the mentality people have gone through with a, with a, with a virus uh, 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 infection. Uh, 
an antibiotic rather, um, protections. Yeah. It's been here. People have gone through a ma a imagine unimaginable um, that threat and challenge to their life and who they are. You don't get rid of that immediately. People are going to say, how did we get here? How do we yeah. not have this happen again in our future? Yeah. Or like the yeah. leaders that are smart. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. Victor Gemignani. Oh. Uh, of the Appleseed Foundation, also lawyers uh, for equal justice, retired, retired, and uh, it's not as cool as but it sure is. Thank you so much, Victor. Oh, my pleasure, Jay. Thanks for asking me. You take oh. care. Aloha.